should all try to put straws in that manger. Okay, I like Christmas time. I'm I'm considered a Grinch in my house, but I still like Christmas time. I don't know if I like it as much as my family does, but I like Christmas. You know, it's a special time of year. It's a time where, I don't know, there's just a different spirit about people. There's more kindness, more love, more mercy, it seems to be, more graciousness, more patience. These things are going on, and of course, there's presents. Now, come on, let's be fair here, and let's be honest. We all like presents at Christmas time, right? Like, we like to give them, but if you're really honest, you like to get them too, don't you? I, I like to get them. I'll admit it. You guys can just throw me under the bus like that if you want to. It's fine. Anyways, let's pray. Father, I just ask that as we go through this sermon, you will bless us and help us to um, see to see how you feel about Christmas and how you feel about gifts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, we went for a drive, my family, to, to Grayling. We were scheduled to go somewhere else, but that fell through So to, to go look at Christmas lights. And so I said, hey, let's just go to Grayling. And in Grayling, anywhere, is this neighborhood. And there's quite a few houses in there that have some Christmas lights. Uh, so we went in there, and there was this one house, and it was really creative, I thought. Because they had lights all over the house, and then they were coming down the front of the porch of the house, and then before the corner, you know, where it comes down to the post like this, instead of squaring off, the lights got about halfway and then came at a diagonal down to Mr. Grinch, who made the appearance that he was pulling the lights off of the house, right? And I thought, that was pretty clever. And confession time here, one of my favorite Christmas songs is Mr. Grinch. I love that song, right? <laughs> you're, you're a heel. You know, you, you guys know the song, right? Anyways, so Alicia, Alicia asked me if she could hear the song because I always sing part of it at Christmas time. She's like, can I hear it? And I played her Mr. Grinch, and she liked it. So it's become one of her favorites, so she wants to hear it all the time. So we're going through looks at Christmas lights, and we're just playing Mr. Grinch over and over and over again. And, of course, you guys know the story of Mr. Grinch, right? So Mr. Grinch is this guy that lives on the mountain overlooking a, a nice village. And this village, is, its whole theme is Christmas. They love Christmas. It's Whoville, right? And, and Whoville is just all about Christmas. That's all they want. And you have Mr. Grinch who hates Christmas and everything about it. And every Christmas time when Whoville goes all out and they decorate their houses and they sing songs and spread joy, it just makes Grinch matter and matter and matter. And then he eventually comes down and he's got... Very creative. I wish they made an actual vacuum like that that could suck up all the presents and, you know, all the Christmas lights and stuff. I would settle for one that can just get all the, the needles off the, off the carpet. Anyways, he gets this vacuum. He takes all the presents, and then he takes all the lights, and he has his, his dog who is his horse pulling his sled, and he goes up. You guys know the story, right? Um, my question is this, though. Does God love to give us gifts? Or is God a Grinch? Is God a Grinch at Christmas time? How does he feel about gift giving at Christmas time? James four or James one seventeen. I want you to grab your Bibles. We don't have to go to James right now, but we're going to be going into our Bibles quite a lot. You're going to help me in this sermon. But James, the book of James, chapter one, verse seventeen. The Bible teaches us that every good gift and perfect gift comes from God, meaning that if something is good, then it originated with who? With God, right? And when Jesus spoke on this matter, he said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7 through 11, Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. And or, I'm sorry, or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts 
good things to those who ask him. So, again, you guys already said it, but does the Father, does God love to give us gifts? Absolutely. He likes to do it more than we like to do it, right? So, indeed, God can't be the Grinch, right? Because he loves to give gifts. You know, I was praying and thinking really hard about what to preach this Sabbath. And my wife went many places, and I mean, you know, Christmas time is coming up, and I will see you the day after Christmas, but, you know, it's the week you Sabbath workers. I'm like, any good pastor should preach a Christmas sermon, right? I mean, it's the time of the year you have to preach a Christmas sermon. That's kind of your duty. So I was thinking about that, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to have to do that. And then I started thinking about what's so special about Christmas, and I came to a problem. At first, I thought in my mind, well, I'm not going to preach about gifts because that's materialism. And that's what ruins Christmas, and I'm not going to go there. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that for God, Christmas is about gifts. That indeed, that's what the season is really about. It's about gift giving and gift receiving that god actually enjoys that and that is indeed the purpose of christmas now some of you are thinking that your pastor's lost it and some of you are like oh yeah i'm with you pastor i'm with you right if sharna was here she'd be like amen and by the way open up your wallet because i got some more gifts to buy right that's what my wife would say but some of you are like okay wait a minute pastor are you trying to tell me that christmas is about gift giving and that god is all about the gift giving and i would say yes he is. I would say that we have limited our minds and, and probably have perverted what gift giving is, but God is all about gift giving at Christmas time. So I tried to get away from this thought, but I couldn't. And so I want to take you guys through a Bible study to show you what I'm talking about. So now I need your help. Open up your Bibles to Revelation. Open up your Bibles to Revelation, the book of Revelation. Everybody loves it when the pastor says, go to Revelation or go to Genesis, because Genesis is the first book of the Bible and Revelation is the last book. They're easy to find, right? Revelation chapter 12. Go to Revelation chapter 12, and I'm going to reintroduce you to a story that you know so well. Many of you could probably repeat from memory, but we're going to look at it and pull out a few points. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. As I was pondering what the purpose of Christmas is, I noticed a pattern emerging in the bible it starts with god and it goes through humanity and it returns to god and as i was looking at this i noticed a pattern and so i want to share that with you go to revelation chapter 12 and verse 7 revelation 12 verse 7 and there was war in heaven there was what in heaven michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels so the bible is clear that there is war in heaven now you all know this right but the point i'm getting here is where did war start in heaven now would usually we would automatically think that you know war something that's as bad as war would start in a in a terrestrial level an earth level right and not the celestial realm but it actually started in the celestial realm according to the bible yes or no yes right okay now we got to look at where the war ends Go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Revelation 12 and verse 17. The Bible says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So war started in heaven, but its conclusion is going to end where? On earth, right? It started in heaven, but it's, it's, it's spilled down and it's came to earth, and this is where it will be concluded, right? In earth. All right, so... That means, whether we like it or not, we're caught in the middle of a war between God and Satan, between good and evil. And so far, we've learned that there was war in heaven, and it continued to where we are today. So how do we get out of this war? What is God's solution? The answer is in the middle of the verses we've looked at. Revelation 12, 10, and 11. The Bible says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the what? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. So the weapon that has been formed by God 
to counteract this war, to put an end to this war, is what? The blood of the Lamb. It's Jesus. In other words, the weapon that has been formed to get us out of this war and to end this war is love. Because 1 John 4, 8 tells us God is love. So God's weapon to fight this war and put an end to this war is love. Are you guys with me so far? All right, now I have a question for you. How does God give us and show us this love? The answer is easy. You already know it. But for the sake of the sermon, let's just go there. John chapter 3, verse 16, right? So far is my, is my logic making sense? Am I tracking down the right path? All right, John chapter 3 and verse 6. 16, sorry, 16, if the, if the weapon forged in this battle is loved, if that is what is going to give us victory and bring a conclusion to the war, how does God give us and show us this love? And, of course, most of you could repeat this verse from memory, and it, is, of course, is um, 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life so god so loved the world that he did what he gave who his son he gave jesus so there's a war and god said i'm going to put an end to this war it's going to be through love and i'm going to give you the gift of my son so that you can overcome are you with me all right so the father then he says you find yourself in a bad situation so i'm going to give you a gift I'm going to gift you something to get you out of your bad situation. Are you with me? All right. So now we have the picture of the Father giving us Son and ultimately eternal life through Jesus, right? Now, I understand this wasn't on Christmas, and actually Jesus was really probably born in the spring, and I can actually prove that in Psalms, but not right now. Anyway, but... It is the time we gather together to recognize the gift of Jesus. So right now, you're thinking, okay, this is very basic, Pastor. We already knew all this, and of course we did. I understand that. But let's follow this thought process a little further. So how did Jesus respond to being gifted by the Father to all of us so that we could be saved and live forever with him? So Jesus is a gift from who? From the Father, right? To who? To us. And how does he respond to being this gift to us. All right, are you with me? Go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verses 5 through 7. John 16, 5 through 7. We're looking for an answer in how Jesus responds to being this gift from the Father to us. What does Jesus do in return? John chapter 16 Verses 5 through 7. I see a couple pages turning, so I'll give you another minute to get there. John chapter 16, verses 5 through 7. The Bible says in verse 5, John 16, But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask me where I go. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter... The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, that is, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will do what? I will send him to you. In other words, Jesus, the gift of the Father, accomplishes his mission. He goes back to heaven, and in return, he does what? He gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, right about now, most of you are going where I'm going, and you figured out what this sermon was all about. All right? So, before we continue on this train of thought, though, let's take a moment to appreciate when the Holy Spirit was given to us and what actually took place so that we could have the Holy Spirit. We all love Acts chapter 2. It's filled with inspired preaching and prophecy and gifts. But let's look at this concept a little closer. Now, if I were to ask you what gifts were given that day, you might respond something like gifts. 
the gift of tongues was given to us on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, right? A lot of you would automatically go to that thought process in your mind because when we read the chapter, we see that there's all these different people standing out there, all these different people that come from different, lang- or from different countries, they speak different languages, and all of a sudden the apostles start preaching, and everyone hears in their own language, right? And we say, there it is, the gift of tongues. And you're absolutely right, and it's a beautiful, marvelous Wonderful gift. And let me just be very clear that we all understand something. The gift of tongues is a gift from God. It's from the Holy Spirit. All right? The Bible is very clear about that. In Acts chapter 2, we see that played out, and we think, what a marvelous gift. It was very useful on that day, right? Okay. But my question is, before we go to Acts and before we look at the gift of tongues and before we see all that, we need to ask a question. And that question is this, where did Jesus tell the disciples to go after he died? All right, very good. You guys know the story. All right, so before Jesus starts his heavenly ministry, he visits the disciples, and in the books of Acts, he gives us the answer. So turn there, the book of Acts. You're in John right now, so you just got to turn a few pages. Acts chapter 1. And we are going to see four and five. It's interesting. As I study this out, I don't know why I never, I never saw this before. But if you look at the last chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 24, you'll see about six verses in there. And you'll see that in Acts, in the book of Acts chapter 1, he repeats that. In other words, I believe that this is the first sermon series preached in the Bible. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe it happened in the Old Testament somewhere else. But in the book of Acts, chapter 1, Luke is actually repeating what he had already stated in Luke 24. And now he's going to give us more information. But this is something that is said that he tells us in this where the disciples were told to go. In Acts, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, Jesus is now he's 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 risen from the grave. He he is um, in his grave glorified body and he is making a visit to the disciples again right before he ascends to heaven and he tells them this in acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father which saith he you have heard from me for john truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the what holy ghost not many days from now right Okay, so we read that they're to wait in Jerusalem for the what? For the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. But what had to happen? What had to happen before they could receive the Holy Spirit? Okay, I hear some comments. I don't want to say you're wrong. But something had to take place so that the Holy Spirit could be given to the earth. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Keep your fingers here. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Paul tells us what took place on the day of Pentecost. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 18 through 21. Now, Hebrews is written to the Diaspora Jews, right? But it's written for the Hebrew mind. You understand what I'm saying? Hebrews is a book written by Paul, and I believe it had to be Paul. There's debate about that, but if it wasn't Paul, I don't know who else it could have been. He's the only one intelligent enough to write this book because this is, this is a masterpiece of Old Testament literature. I know it's in the New Testament, but, I mean, he is, he is, giving, us, he is giving us commentary on the Old Testament, and this is a masterpiece. This is as good as it gets. This is like... A crowning achievement, right? Like in the English language, you can think of books that are written that you enjoy reading, and then there's other books that you're like, okay, this is a masterpiece book, right? That's what Hebrews is. It's like the opus of the New Testament, right? So Paul is writing here, and he's given us commentary, and he's about to explain to us, he's about to explain to us what happened on the day of Pentecost before the Holy Spirit could be poured out on the disciples. Are you ready? Hebrews chapter 9, verses 18 through 21. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated with, without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testimony, of the testament, sorry, which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled 
with blood, both the what? Tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. So Paul's telling us here, he says, when Moses was told to build a sanctuary, when he was told to build a temple, when he's told to build a tabernacle, right? He did that so that Jesus could dwell with us because our sins separate us from who? From God, right? And so God's plan was to build a temple, a, a sanctuary, a tabernacle, if you will. And in there, he was going to eliminate what? Sin. Very good, right? Before that tabernacle on earth could be used, it had to be what? It had to be dedicated. It had to be inaugurated. It had to be suited for service. It had to be readied for service, right? Now, if you guys know your, your New Testaments, and you do, I know your faithful Adventists here, right? The earthly tabernacle is a copy of what? The heavenly tabernacle, the true tabernacle according to God, right? And just like the earthly tabernacle had to be inaugurated or anointed for service, so did the heavenly tabernacle. And so what you see here, Paul is describing to you this heavenly scene in the heavenly tabernacle. And after Jesus' sacrifice, after his death on the cross, after his mission on earth, he ascends into heaven and he's anointing the heavenly tabernacle. Now, what day do you think this took place on? I gave you a big clue. It took place, thank you, it takes place in Acts chapter 2. So turn back there really quick. Acts chapter 2, it takes place, the anointing of this temple in heaven, the inauguration of this temple in heaven takes place in Acts chapter 2 because the gift that God gave us, the Father, is not done. It didn't end with the death of the cross. It didn't end at the resurrection. The gift the Father gave us still has more purpose. And so we see this played out in Acts chapter 2. Okay. So then, what took place on Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost? Now, before we look at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, we're going to go to the end so I can show you something, and then I'll show you how it fits into the beginning. Acts chapter 2, verses 32 and 33. Acts chapter 2, verses 32 and 33. Verse 32, this Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the what? He hath shed forth this, which now you see and hear. So what took place? Jesus dies. He comes back and tells his disciple, you need to go to Jerusalem and you need to wait there so I can send you the what? The Holy Ghost. So before Jesus can send the Holy Ghost, something has to take place, right? Are you with me? And that event that had to take place was that they had to inaugurate the heavenly temple for services to eliminate what? Sin, right? And at this point, on the day of Pentecost, Jesus' ministry leaves from being the sacrifice, it leaves from being resurrected, and it turns into a mediatorial role. In other words, on this day, Jesus becomes our high priest, and he intercedes for us continually. Now, you should have said amen, but I know this is kind of deep, right? But let me tell you this. Without a high priest interceding for you, without a high priest interceding for me, none of us are going to heaven. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is one of the most amazing parts of the gift that not only Jesus died for us, not only did he live again for us, but he continues to serve us even now on a daily basis, right? Now, I can picture this scene in heaven right now. I can see the Father, and I can see Jesus standing in the courtyard at the entrance of the heavenly temple. And I can see them both looking at each other with very proud faces, very happy that they have now accomplished what needed to be accomplished to eliminate sin forever and to end the war. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand fully that they knew that this was going to happen. But now it's actually happened. It's a moment for celebration because what they had told us was going to happen actually took place. And I see them standing together in front of the tabernacle in the heavenly court. And Jesus is being anointed. And do you remember how the holy priest, I'm sorry, the high priest was anointed in the Old Testament? Anybody? They poured oil 
over him. What does oil represent in the Bible? The Holy Spirit. The Father looks at the Son and he says, well done, Son. Well done. Thank you. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love for humanity. And he pours the oil over his head and he says, now, now you can intercede for them. Now you can intercede for Pastor Jay. And I can see that oil, that great vat of pure oil starting on Jesus' head and running down his face, rushing off his beard over his pierced side and down over his pierced nail his nail-pierced feet, and dripping down to earth and being poured out on all of us, on the apostles, as the Holy Spirit in tongues of fire. Tongues of fire. In other words, Jesus gave the Acts of the Apostles the Holy Spirit. And as soon as the Holy Spirit came upon them, he gave them gifts. Before they even knew that the Holy Spirit was upon him, the Holy Spirit had already given them gifts. Do you see the picture we have emerging here? Are you following me so far? <laughs> Amen. The Father gives us the gift of Jesus. Jesus gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us the spiritual gifts. What was the purpose of the gifts? Amen. Acts chapter 2, 36 through 41. The Holy Spirit is given to us and as soon as he's given to us, as soon as they're baptized by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit gives them gifts, right? And he gives them gifts for the purpose of, yes, you are right, Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the what? For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received this word were what? Baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. In other words, the Holy Spirit is a gift from God. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he gives gifts to us. And those gifts are used to bring other people to Jesus in great numbers. Now, I don't know about you. But I would love to be part of an evangelistic campaign where 3,000 souls were added in one day. I would love to see that. I've been in the Philippines and I have seen over 500 people baptized in one day. And let me tell you something. It is a beautiful event that you cannot understand unless you see it. We all walked out to the water hand in hand singing songs. And it wasn't a quiet event. Everybody was singing loud with joy. And they had the peace of the Holy Spirit. And they had the joy of God upon them because they had been freed from the slavery of sin. And they were walking into the great ocean to be baptized so that they could raise and live with Jesus. That day, 3,000 people were added to the church as a result of the gifts that God had gave. But that leads me to a question. How many received the gift? How many received the gift? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 7 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work that one in the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So who gets these gifts? everyone so it's not just the apostles that are receiving these gifts it's who now i want to make this more personal who receives these gifts i like that me you when we accept jesus as our savior when we put our faith in him to save our lives, to save our souls, he then gives us, I shouldn't say he, the Holy Spirit then comes upon us and he gives us what? Gifts for what? For ministry. Gifts for ministry, gifts for edifying, for the building up of the church. Amen. Exactly right. Right? Why does the Holy Spirit give us gifts? For the gift of building up the church of Jesus. For not only bringing people into the church, but for edifying those who are in the church. Amen? To encourage and comfort each other in the church. To make sure that as many as possible will be ready on that day that Jesus comes to take us home. Amen? That is the purpose of the gifts. Right? So, what are these gifts? What are these gifts? I have compiled a list. You can find these listed primarily in four different places in the scriptures. Romans chapter 12, 6 through 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 4 through 11, Ephesians 4, 11, and 1 Peter 4, 10. These gifts include, but are not limited to, the gift of apostleship, prophecy, evangelism, pastoring, teaching, ministry, that would be service, exhortation, encouragement, leadership, acts of mercy, contributions, contributing monetarily to the cause, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, hospitality, distinguishing of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Now, I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list. However, these are the gifts that are listed in the Bible as coming from the Holy Spirit as a gift to use to spread the gospel. You will notice that there's a gift missing. I studied this out with some detail before I got up here to give you all a message, but I couldn't find pew warming listed as a spiritual gift. I see you smiling. It seems ridiculous, doesn't it? But many of us think that's our gift. We think our gift is to come and keep our pew warm, to hold it down to the floor. But I want to make a challenge to you. Today's a good day for Sabbath, right? It's the day unto God. Search the Bible from cover to cover. You can even search the spirit of prophecy. If you can find one reference to pew warming or pew sitting being a spiritual gift, please inform your pastor. I would love to see it. In fact, I would pay you if you could do that. Pew warming, pew sitting is not a spiritual gift. I'm not going to spend a lot of time rebuking here. I think you understand the point. My point is this, though. Each and every one of you have been given a gift. You've been given a gift. Some of you have been given multiple gifts. And what have you been given those gifts for? For spreading the gospel. For edifying your brothers and sisters in the church. It's interesting. As I studied this out, I found another Interesting theme, if you will. I know I'm saying that word a lot. Sorry for repeating. But some gifts are universal gifts, and yet there seems to be a degree of gift attached to them. That might have been a little confusing, but let me help you with that. For instance, if you read in those lists that I gave you, you will see that one of the spiritual gifts given is the gift of faith. However, I've got to tell you right now, 
that while some may have more faith than others, if you don't have faith, you're not going to be in heaven. Because we're not saved by works, right? We're saved by grace through faith in who? So everybody has to have an element of faith in them, right? There's another gift that you could make an argument, and I don't know if it's conclusive, but I, I wouldn't argue with you too much. You could say, Pastor, let me back up a little bit. There's another gift, I believe, that everybody's been given and told to do, but you might not have that degree. In fact, I'll tell you of two more. There's a gift of hospitality, right? And some might be better at hosting than others, but make no mistake, God has commanded all of us to be hospitable. You understand what I'm saying? And there's another gift. And maybe you have said this before. And if you had, don't raise your hand. This is not a shaming session. This is an informational session. And you can take from this what you need to and go pray about any changes that God would have you to make, right? Have you ever heard somebody say, well, that's just not my gift? Have you ever heard that expression before? You can acknowledge that part. That's not... That's not uncomfortable. Maybe you've said that. Don't acknowledge that. But I'm just saying, maybe you said that, but you've probably heard, well, that's just not my gift, pastor. Or that's just not my gift, personal ministry leader. Or that's just not my gift, right? But again, I just want to reiterate something really quick, and this is not condemning in any way. Raise your hand if you have received a gift or multiple gifts from the Holy Spirit. Okay. Some of you might be paraplegic, all right? And I'll accept that if you are paraplegic. But if you're not paraplegic, you need to raise your hand. Because the Bible says he gives them to each and every one. Are you in each and every one if you're sitting here? Amen. How many of you have received a gift or multiple gifts from the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand. Oh, thank you. That's very good. See, if you guys all raise your hand and I get it on video, I can be like, look, I have them so excited. They're raising their hands in the aisle. All right, moving on. <laughs> Amen. I'm sorry. I was just joking with that last stuff. <laughs> okay. Mm, I gotcha. I hear you, what you're saying now. All right, so turn with me to Acts chapter 8. Turn with me to Acts chapter 8, right? So we already know that the gift of the Holy Spirit, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is faith, right? And while there might be a variance degree of faith in an individual's life, right, everybody needs to have a level of faith. Would you all agree with that statement? And you might have a gift from the Holy Spirit of the Holy Spirit on hospitality, right? You might be better at hosting people and more adept at hosting people than others are, but every Christian has to have a certain degree, a certain level of hospitality. Are you with me? All right. Turn to me to Acts chapter 8 because I want to share one more gift with you that I hear this all the time and it drives me crazy. All right? Are you guys there at Acts chapter 8? We're going to look at verse 1 before we do. Before we do, i got to ask another question. Okay. Did you notice in those lists of gifts the gift of preaching? It wasn't there. You know, you could make an argument to me, and I wouldn't argue you. You could say, well, there's the words of knowledge. There's the words of wisdom. That must include preaching. You could make that argument, and maybe you would be right. Maybe. I'm, I'm not completely sure, but I wouldn't argue with you if you said that. But my point is this. It's not listed as the gift of preaching in the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to preach? It means what? Someone said over here. To tell the good news. Teach is fine. I would accept that as well. Sorry. Okay. Let's look at Acts chapter 8 because I want to show you something very important right now. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. As soon as I get there, we'll look at it. Sorry. I was sleeping on my job up here. All right, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul, you know who Saul was, right? This was before he became Paul. Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great what? Persecution against the church, which was at where? Jerusalem. And they were all, what? Scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the who? Except the who? One more time. I want to burn that into your gray matter. Except the who? The apostles. You are with me. So let's summarize this verse really quick, okay? 
And I, I'm just going to warn you right now, you're walking into a trap. But remember, this is not a shaming session. This is not a guilt session. This is an information session. You can go back down after you get your information, and you can pray to God, and you can do what he wants you to do, right? I am just a pastor. I am just a messenger. I am not the Holy Spirit or the God in any way, and you guys do what you do for him, right? Not for me. And I, I appreciate the respect you give me, but let's just make that very clear, right? All right, so I'm just going to summarize Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Paul, or Saul, before he became Paul, when he was still a Pharisee, was running around and he was persecuting who? Christians, right? And he was doing this at such a great length in Jerusalem that people that were being persecuted started being what? Scattered abroad everywhere, except for who? The apostles. So the Christian members, the church members were leaving in droves and they were scattered abroad everywhere. But the apostles stayed where? In Jerusalem. All right. Very good. We are 100% clear about that, right? Okay. Let's move on. And devout men, verse 2, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. They were sad to lose Stephen. And we all would have been. He was a great, a great man of God and used his gifts in the church. Verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were what? They that were scattered abroad went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. Who was preaching? Who's they? Those who were scattered abroad, according to the Bible, right? No, I, your answers are right. I'm with you. Those who were scattered abroad. Who was not scattered abroad? The apostles. They weren't the ones preaching. Who was preaching? Now, I'm going to ask this question. Whose job is it to preach? Everyone's. Everyone's job. Raise your hand with me if you see conclusively today that it is your job to preach. If you greet that statement, raise your hand. Okay, I agree with that statement. Amen? Now, I understand that doesn't mean that everybody has to get up in a pulpit in front of a church and give a discourse, okay? There are some that are called to do that, some are not. But every single one of you, including myself, can preach the good news of Jesus. We can tell everybody about the good news of Jesus, and we can use the gifts that the Holy Spirit gave us. And by your own admission, every single one of you have a gift or multiple gifts from the Holy Spirit. Am I right? Okay. Amen. Are you a Grinch? What is the point of Christmas? It's gift-giving. It is absolutely gift-giving. Now, I know that we've perverted what that means, but in its purest form, it is gift-giving. The Father gave us the Son. The Son gave us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave us gifts, and when we use those gifts and we lead people to Jesus, that's our gift to the Father. Christmas is absolutely about gift-giving. Are you going to be a great? And I'm going to extend it. Christmas should be a 365, 24-7 thing. And on leap year, it should be a 366, 24-7 thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? We can't afford to be Grinch any longer. Because Grinch is dwindling our churches. Grinch is robbing joy from our friends and family and community members. Grinch is preventing Jesus from coming back. However, the spirit, the spirit of Christmas, gift giving, and using those gifts can reunite us with Jesus. Amen? Amen. You guys have probably heard this story. It took place in Brainerd, Minnesota. This car pulled into a Dairy Queen parking lot and ordered some food. They pulled up to the window after they made their order to pay for it. And they said, I would like to pay for my food and for the car behind me. You guys have heard of this happen before, right? 
paying it forward at a drive through Yes. So this car did that. And there is no way this car could have known what they were about to start simply by gift giving. The next car pulled up and said, the lady looked at her and said, by the way, the person in front of you paid for your order. You can pay it forward if you want, or you can have your order. And the next car said, well, I want to pay it forward too. And the third car pulled up. Well, I want to pay it forward. And the fourth car pulled up. Well, I want to pay it forward. Three days later, 900 cars had passed through that drive through paying it forward to the next one behind them. It's an amazing story of gift giving. But there's an element of the story that goes overlooked. It ended with one person saying, no, I'm good. I just want the gift. I don't want charity. Now, I understand that it's possible that this person ordered, you know, a $2 blizzard and the person behind them ordered $50 of food. Okay, that took place several times, according to the article. But my point is this, where that falls flat, the gifts from the Holy Spirit do not. They are free. You can freely share them. You can freely use them all you want, as much as you want. And you can use them to benefit the person behind you, the person in front of you, the person beside you, wherever you are. We don't need to be that 900th car. Do you understand what I'm saying? We want to be one through 899. We want to use these gifts. Who's with me? Amen. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this great gift giving that you've started, this pay it forward. You sent the Son, the Son sent the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit sent us gifts, and we can give you gifts by using those gifts to bring others to you. Lord, what an amazing theme of gift giving in the Bible. I just ask that you will bless us and give us more courage and more boldness to use our gifts, and may we be more and more effective with them as we surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.